My name is Will Tarpe, and um, I'm here with my graduate student, Anna Kogler, who is uh, in civil and environmental engineering and is a Stanford uh, graduate uh, interdisciplinary fellow uh, focused on environmental engineering. And she'll give some of the talk today so you get a sense of what our students are up to as well. Today we're going to talk about wastewater and the kind of crazy, futuristic, but possible idea of making water pollution obsolete and a thing of the past. Water pollution, what do you think of when you think of water pollution? Either pollutants or what, what does it make you think of? You can just shout out an answer. PFAS. Chemicals, PFAS, forever chemicals, sewage, what else? Oil. Oil. Fertilizer. Fertilizer. What, what else? Trash, Trash. absolutely. Medicine. Medicine, medications, plastics. Coal, coal, dust. coal dust, right? There's so many things that can dirty up water and make it what we call wastewater. So a friend of mine recently um, reminded me of this quote, and I really love it. It's from uh, Buckminster Fuller, who you may know of as one of the, uh, or as he's popularized the uh, fullerenes, fullerenes, which are kind of six, 60 carbon geodesic molecules. But he, uh, several decades ago, said, of, said something that in many ways is the vision of the research we do in my research group. And it's that pollution is nothing but misplaced resources, right? We only call things pollution when they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. In fact, if we get them in the right place at the right time, they're back to products, right? And so much of what we do is think about pollution, and we do it in a way that where we're simply ignorant, not in a bad way, but we, don't, we underestimate the value of what's in wastewater. So the vision of what we do as a research group is taking what's in wastewater, resituating in the right place at the right time, and turning it into valuable products. So we are envisioning a future where pollution doesn't really exist because every wastewater is mined for maximal value, and we're able to tune selective uh, approaches that can get just one element out at a time and continue to mine wastewater for the future. So most of the time we think of treating wastewaters as uh, something that costs us things. It costs us money, it costs us energy, it costs us chemical inputs. When we look at the Environmental Protection Agency's annual budget, we spend about $270 billion a year across the country on cleaning up water and wastewater. I want you to focus in particular on the red and orange slices of this pie these are the ones focused on wastewater treatment. So we spend about $100 billion every year across the country to treat wastewater. Um, when we think about California, we spend about 20% of our state energy budget on treating and transporting water. And so many of you may be familiar with the State Water Project, which takes water from Northern California down to Southern California. We also spend plenty of energy desalinating water and doing other things to make uh, water useful to us. Finally, we spend a lot of chemical inputs to be able to treat water, so, wastewater so that it's dischargeable to the environment. These are things like flocculants and coagulants that are in primary wastewater treatment, and also disinfectants like chlorine or hydrogen peroxide to clean up wastewater at the end. Um, so as we think about this, wastewaters are not just a way to, uh, wastewaters are not just a source of expenses, but they can also be a source of products, as I mentioned. So we kind of jokingly call this our food pyramid within the lab. These are all the things that we can recover from wastewater. And our goal here is to move up this pyramid to recover not just energy and fuels, but to recover things like fertilizers, like some people mentioned, commodity chemicals that are used in large amounts, and also fine chemicals. What if we could recover pharmaceuticals from wastewater and, and, and put them back into a pharmaceutical plant? What if we could recover dyes or precursors to very expensive uh, molecules like polymers or uh, monomer precursors? And so this is our our goal here is to diversify the portfolio of wastewater-derived products by increasing value and potentially decreasing volume as we go up here. But that's okay because you might not have as much, but it's of much higher value. So we're constantly trying to produce higher purity, higher value products from wastewater. So we think about this a lot in terms of cycles. And so many of you have probably heard the concept of a circular economy, broadly speaking. Uh, meaning that we try to turn these lines in the economy where we extract raw materials and then end up emitting pollutants. We try to turn those and bend those into circles instead. And we do this by focusing specifically on element-specific economy. So rather than the broad idea of a circular economy, let's make a lithium circular economy, a nitrogen circular economy, a phosphorus circular economy. And so these kind of go through several different parts of our society, whether it's wastewater treatment, agriculture, industries, and our job as we see it is to design these red boxes where you see recovery happening. Most of the time in chemical engineering and manufacturing, we use different driving forces, like temperature or pressure, to make a reaction go in the way that we want it to. Here, we're also introducing electricity as a way to do this. And this is a way 
of electrifying manufacturing. If since we have many electrons from renewable energy, why not use solar energy, use wind energy, et cetera, to power some of these next generation manufacturing processes. Let's go to the next slide. So there are many, many element-specific circular economies. Um, we don't have time to talk about all of these today, but I wanted to just introduce you to some of them as a way of um, kind of igniting your imagination or validating some things that you've already thought about. Kind of, why don't we make products out of desalination, Brian? Um, turns out we can at the bench scale in the lab. We want to try to scale that up. We can also think about recovering phosphorus, which is a scarce material, and some estimates put us at running out of this, whether it's in decades or centuries, but it's a, it's a scarce and limited material. Sulfur is a key component of many fertilizers and also um, uh, many industries, and so we can recover this from several wastewaters. And then most recently, we've been doing work very close to um, energy uh, focused on lithium ion batteries and being able to recover lithium from spent batteries. And this is because lithium ion batteries, as we are all thinking about Teslas and we're using our cell phones, all these things, lithium ion battery consumption is increasing, but we're not sure what to do with those once they reach end of life. What if we could recover the lithium from them and make a lithium circular economy? This is th these are the things we, we dream of and we try to make happen. Let's go to the next slide. So most of today we'll focus on nitrogen, but we'll look at a few other elements as well. Why do we focus on nitrogen? Nitrogen is one of the biogeochemical cycles that humans have changed the most. Many of us have thought a lot about the carbon cycle, which of course is something that humans have changed drastically. To put this into perspective, humans have changed the total amount of carbon on Earth by around 10 to 20%. We've changed the total amount of nitrogen on Earth by more like 100%. Okay, so carbon emissions, of course, are closely tied to, to uh, greenhouse gases and other kind of runaway climate effects, but you'll see in a second that if we look at the natural nitrogen cycle, it's well balanced, but humans have skewed this due to fertilizer production by the Haber-Bosch process, and we're not able to remove as much nitrogen as we would like from wastewater treatment plants. And so this does two things. It doubles the throughput of nitrogen in the environment and also skews this uh, very important and critical um, uh, cycle. So let's go to the next animation. So our goal here is to recycle this nitrogen in place uh, through separations and also through uh, reactions. And so what are the consequences of the nitrogen cycle as we know it now? In most cases, what it leads to is these harmful algal blooms. So um, this is a remote sensing satel a satellite photo from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And so if you've been in the Gulf of Mexico or you've been in the Midwest and some of the Great Lakes, you may have seen these green algae blooms that, that pop up every spring, right? And so in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a New Jersey-sized plume that happens every year. And what that is is algae that are over-consuming nitrogen that we emit from our wastewaters. They overconsume oxygen, and that leads to fish kills, and it changes aquatic ecosystems. And so this New Jersey-sized plume, what do we do about it every year? Really nothing. We just wait for it to turn over naturally. What we're trying to do is prevent that plume before it happens. So let's go to the next slide. Nitrogen also plays a critical role in fertilizer production. Um, the Haber-Bosch process is probably one of the processes that affects us most, but many of us don't know about or don't think about so much. And that's because it's really been the way that we fed the world over the 20th century. So Haber-Bosch supports about half of global agriculture. And so here on this graph, you're seeing a comparison of what the world population has been with Haber-Bosch and what it would have been projected to be without Haber-Bosch. So when we look at this, if we go to the next, uh, next slide, we can see back on this reactive nitrogen, what we've done again is doubled the sources of reactive nitrogen. And this need is only going to intensify. As we have increasing numbers on Earth, we're going to need to continue to increase our agricultural output. So uh, we're just going to need to keep doing this more and more and more. Let's go to the next slide. And so current nitrogen management has a few challenges. Environmentally, as we saw before, this is now a satellite image of uh, Lake Erie outside of Cleveland. We, get, we put over 100 megatons of nitrogen into aquatic environments every year. And this 1.2% of global CO2 emissions may not sound like much, but when you think about the thousands of manufacturing processes there are, this is one of the most emissions intensive uh, environment, uh, manufacturing processes that we use. There are also equity challenges here. If we look around the world, these black dots are where there are Haber-Bosch fertilizer production plants. You'll note there are whole continents that have very few of these. And the farther you are from a Haber-Bosch plant, the more you pay for fertilizer. So a citizen in Mali might pay double the amount of one of us for fertilizer uh, simply because they're far away from a Haber-Bosch plant. Next slide. So let's talk about what wastewater can do for us when it comes to nitrogen. Here, if we look at how much uh, fertilizer is produced and how much nitrogen is produced by the Haber-Bosch process over several decades, some in the past and some in the future, 
we can see that wastewater derived nitrogen, especially from fertilizer and uh, from fertilizer runoff and uh, municipal wastewater, can address about 30% of this. We can go to the next one, Anna. Um, and so 30% of total, this total nitrogen can be um, recovered from fertilizer runoff and municipal wastewater. So we can solve two problems at once. We're letting all this nitrogen into the environment. It's causing all these damages, can cause billions of dollars in damages. And we're just leaving it on the table. We're not using it even though we need it, right? So we're kind of giving it away for free and not using it and so paying for it later. A lot of times we think about which wastewater should we prioritize. And so this graph is showing, and you can animate a couple, um, that both ammonia and nitrate polluted wastewaters present valid opportunities. So here we're looking at concentrations of nitrogen in wastewaters. And the point here is that even the two green ones are nitrate, the two uh, purple ones are ammonia. And you can see that in short, nitrate uh, polluted wastewaters are less concentrated, but they're more abundant, there's more of them. And so these present about equal opportunities on an order of magnitude basis uh, to recover nitrogen from. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, I've given you kind of a, a big background on resource recovery and why it's important on nitrogen specifically. I want to leave you in this introduction in thinking about kind of a new term that we're calling wastewater refining. And this is developed over time based on how we've cleaned up water over the past several decades. In most cases, and historically, we have focused on pollutant removal. And that just simply means you have a contaminant, you want to make sure it doesn't reach the environment, you just remove it, and then it's not in the water, and you deal with it later. It might be in the air, it might be in a solid, but you don't worry about that, you just worry about the fact that you cleaned up the water, okay? Recently, we've started thinking about recovery, and recovery is when, as we define it, it's when you take a compound that was in wastewater and you recover it without changing it. So if there was ammonia in the wastewater, you pull it out, and you have ammonia as a product. If there was nitrate in the wastewater, you pull it out, and you have nitrate as a product. Same for lithium, same for phosphorus. The next frontier of wastewater treatment as we see it, is refining. And refining, we're borrowing this term on purpose and kind of repurposing it from oil and gas refining. At an oil and gas refinery, you take in crude oil, right? And then you can you, uh, determine what the composition is, and then you turn a lot of knobs on different processes to make different types of fuels, different types of plastics, all these different things, petroleum, jelly, all these different products. We're imagining the same thing but for wastewater. What if we could determine the composition of a wastewater then tune all these different processes to make all these different types of products from it. Why, why limit ourselves to just one? Why not make a refinery approach? And that's what we're doing with refining, where we're actually transforming the contaminant into another product. So taking nitrate, and rather than, than just separating it as nitrate, what if we turn it into ammonia, right? What if we actually chemically convert it to something else and not just separate it from the wastewater? So in short, this is the, the brass tacks of how we actually mine wastewater for valuable products. So um, Anna, actually, this is a, a paper that Anna uh, was the lead author on. We started to look at all the different wastewater treatment processes there are and tried to classify them according to, especially on the right here, where they focus on removal, recovery, or refining. In short, very few of them are focused on refining, which made us confident that this is a pressing and urgent frontier. And you can see for nitrogen, most of them focus on ammonia, not on nitrate, even though nitrate is the most common nitrogen pollutant. So this has situated some of our work and really uh, made us think more about what the promise of wastewater refining is. Okay, so as a lab, we kind of focus ourselves around four uh, main tasks, and I'll hand it off to Anna in a second. The first is that we focus on designing selective materials, so designing membranes or designing adsorbents, and by adsorbents, I just mean kind of the beads if you broke open a Brita filter, right, or a water filter, you would see beads. We design those beads, but to be selective for specific ions. So that's our work on selective materials. Anna will talk uh, in depth about some of our work on using electrochemistry, in short, using electric current to drive migration and transformation of chemical pollutants, and then some of our work on contaminant feet. What happens to everything that's left in the wastewater? And many of you, given the pandemic, have probably heard about a wastewater-based epidemiology or monitoring SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID in wastewater. Uh, we have a little bit of that work that we can show you at the end. And, uh, and finally, some of our work in resource-constrained communities. So we do a lot of our work here in the U.S. at many different uh, places, and then some work also in sub-Saharan Africa. But we're focused in particular on not just wastewater, but how can we improve access to sanitation by making sanitation pay for itself in some ways? And how do we do that? By recovering valuable products from urine in particular. So with that, I'll hand it over to Anna. Okay, great. So as Will said, I'll be talking about electrochemical processes for resource recovery, um, particularly focusing on nitrogen, um, and also, oh, a little louder, okay. And also um, talking about some applications in resource-constrained communities. 
So um, to start off, um, we've been working on a process called electrochemical stripping, or ECS, which is able to recover nitrogen, ammonia nitrogen specifically, simply based on charge and volatility. So this reactor um, consists of three chambers um, and some electrodes, as well as membranes. And we introduce ammonia-rich wastewater into the leftmost chamber and apply an electric current that um, allows us to uh, separate ammonium ions based on charge by driving them across this cation selective membrane into the second chamber. Here, um, electricity is again driving an important reaction where we have um, hydroxide being produced, and that is able to convert ammonium ions into ammonia, which it turns out is volatile. So we can then separate that out into our last chamber simply based on its volatility. And there, we're able to recover it in an acidic solution as ammonium sulfate, which could be applied as a fertilizer. And so, so far, we've tested um, ECS on a variety of wastewaters. Um, oh, sorry, that was a photo of our uh, lab scale reactor. Um, yeah, so we've tested ECS on a variety of wastewaters, including urine, and some of that data is shown here on the left. So you can see um, the mass of nitrogen in each of the three chambers over time. And we see a steady decrease in the amount of nitrogen in the anode, which is the chamber where we introduce the wastewater. And eventually, it all ends up in the trap chamber shown in pink. So we're recovering um, our product. As I said, we've tested ECS on several other wastewaters, and we consistently achieve high recovery efficiencies. So that indicates that ECS is a pretty versatile um, pro uh, process. But let's talk a little bit more about urine, um, because this is one wastewater that uh, is particularly promising for electrochemical nitrogen recovery. So here at this table on the left shows some important characteristics of fresh human urine and hydrolyzed urine. And I'll just point out a few of them. So first, you'll notice that urea is present in fairly high concentrations uh, in the stored urine, or, sorry, in the fresh urine. But then in the stored urine, it's all been converted into ammonia, which is what we can target with our electrochemical stripping process. Now, one other important characteristic is um, that there are other salts present in the urine, and that uh, makes uh, urine particularly amenable to electrochemical treatment. So we've recently started collecting urine um, in Sriram so that we can start to test our technologies on real human urine. Um, and so I, I've already explained that urine um, is amenable to electrochemical treatment, um, but it's also uh, also, separating urine can also have uh, benefits for resource recovery. So this graph is showing that urine contains uh, the majority of nutrients that humans excrete, um, even though it only accounts for 1% of wastewater. So it's a really concentrated stream that we can harness for recovery processes. And we already have the technologies to achieve urine separation. Um, it's just a matter of starting to implement these more widely. And so we recently started working with Waste Development, or Wasted, which is a startup that is focusing on um, bringing urine separation to uh, the portable, portable sanitation systems in the US. And we're hoping that our collaboration can ultimately lead to scale up of uh, urine separation um, and kind of this uh, research center where uh, we're able to test urine treatment technologies. So um, I've talked about electrochemical stripping um, as a way to treat urine and other wastewaters um, and to selectively recover uh, ammonia from those wastewaters as ammonium sulfate. But we're also interested in expanding the product and pollutant portfolios um, that we can treat with electrochemical processes. So on the product side, we've been working on a process called flexible electrochemical stripping, which is very similar to electrochemical stripping but it's able to recover ammonia as both an acidic ammonium product and alkaline ammonia. And that's um, advantageous because, uh, as I said, acidic ammonium is useful as a fertilizer, but alkaline ammonia could be used um, as a chemical feedstock, a disinfectant, and maybe even a fuel. And then on the pollutant side, we have been targeting um, primarily ammonia so far, but we're expanding um, into looking at nitrate, as Will talked about 
um, earlier. And so we've developed a process called electrodialysis and nitrate reduction, or EDNR, to do that. So I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about FECS, or flexible electrochemical stripping. So this process um, has the same first three chambers as electrochemical stripping, and again, just uses charge and volatility to recover ammonia. We've simply added a fourth chamber and a second electrochemical circuit that allows us to separate out ammonium based on its charge again, and so we can recover it in the fourth chamber um, as an ammonium hydroxide solution. But at the same time, we also get ammonium sulfate in our third chamber. So this figure is showing um, some experimental data on this process where we're looking at removal efficiency in blue and all the different recovery efficiencies in green uh, over time. And we see that removal occurs quite rapidly. Um, and when we only operate the first electrochemical cell in FECS, we primarily recover ammonium sulfate. However, once we turn on the second electrochemical cell, we see a decrease in the ammonium sulfate and an increase in ammonium hydroxide. And so we're really able to tailor the product speciation simply by controlling when we apply electricity to that second uh, cell. And this ability to tailor product speciation has the potential to um, expand the context in which we can apply um, these, these electrochemical recovery technologies um, and allows us to respond to changing market conditions. So for example, our partner, Delvic Sanitation Initiatives in Senegal, operates both rural and urban treatment plants. And so it might be advantageous to produce one type of product in one location and a different one um, in the other. Uh, great, so now that I've talked about um, how we're expanding product portfolios, let's switch over to talking about different pollutants and how EDNR or electrodialysis and nitrate reduction helps us do that. So EDNR um, is a process that can treat both ammonia and nitrate and recovers both of these as ammonia. And it relies on two phases, first electrodialysis and second nitrate reduction. During electrodialysis, wastewater is introduced into the middle chamber here and we uh, separate out ammonia to the right chamber and nitrate to the left just based on their charges. And then during the second phase, we change the electrodes to which we apply the potential and we're able to reduce nitrate to ammonia in the left chamber. And we can continuously switch between these two modes to increase the amount of ammonia and nitrate that we're recovering. So looking at the performance during the first phase, electrodialysis, we can quantify an electrodialysis efficiency, which is simply the fraction uh, or the ratio of the amount of ammonia that ends up in the right chamber relative the, to the amount of ammonia that started in the middle chamber. We can see in this figure that as we operate the process for multiple cycles, we can increase that electrodialysis efficiency. Then moving on to the nitrate reduction phase, we can look at a nitrate reduction efficiency, which is simply the, the amount of ammonia that's formed in the leftmost chamber relative to the amount of nitrate that's present in the middle chamber initially. And here again, looking at uh, multiple cycles of operation, we see an increase um, in nitrate reduction efficiency over time. And so, so far we have demonstrated proof of concept for this process and we're working on some more fundamental studies to continue to improve its performance. And so with that, I'll just summarize quickly um, that we're working on developing electrochemical processes that are able to treat multiple contaminants um, and turn them into multiple types of products um, to facilitate a circular nitrogen economy. And I'll turn it back to Will. Fantastic, okay, I think I just have to point this better. Okay, so Anna's given us some great background on electrochemical processes, so I'll um, give you some more uh, background on the selective materials that we're making in the lab as well. Okay, so when we think about designing, and again, in your head, think of a, a Brita filter and breaking it open, or a water filter you've seen, and there are these particles in there. We're trying to design those particles uh, to make them selective. Um, and so there are three things we think about. Capacity, and an analogy you can think about is a parking lot, right? Um, so capacity is how many, how many uh, lots there, how many uh, spots there are in the parking lot. And then we can also think about selectivity. 
Um, if you have a preference to park uh, closer or farther away, um, and we want to look for a, a certain ion or their compact um, uh, uh, spots in the parking lot, we can also think about those. The last one is regenerability. How long does it take to, um, how many times can you reuse this over and over? When does the parking lot have to get repaved, right? And so we're thinking about this specifically for um, nitrogen still, and again, trying to pluck nitrogen out of a very diverse wastewater. So when we think about this, um, we can think about, and one of my PhD students, Brandon, has been designing kind of these new uh, filter materials to go into uh, these selective filters. And so these are some of the uh, molecular formulas for what he's doing, but you can just remember some of these acronyms, weak acid cation exchangers and a sodium aminodiacetate resin. So those are fun uh, chemistry words to keep in mind, but we just call these WACG and SIR. So these are two kind of host materials that we can modify. So uh, the first thing we can do is think about uh, going through this cycle. So we can take a, a metal and load it into the, this resin because both of these resins are negatively charged. So we're attracting a positive charge to a negative site. And then we can do selective nitrogen adsorption because ammonia interacts with these metals in a very specific way, making a covalent bond. And then we can recover the nitrogen by protonating the ammonia, turning it into ammonium. And this ammonium will come off uh, such that we've created a high purity nitrogen product once we're ready. Okay, so what this means is that uh, we can achieve uh, high, highly selective and highly, um, highly selective materials without sacrificing capacity. So that means if we look at the top left graph here, we can look at the selectivity of ammonia over potassium, one of its uh, kind of uh, strongest competitors. And so there's this kind of sweet spot in terms of the concentration on the x-axis where we can see high selectivities. We can do this without sacrificing capacity, which is again how many spots there are for ammonia on the different resins, and here we're looking at, it's a two by two matrix of copper and zinc on the two different types of resin, the WACG and the SIR. Then we started testing this in more realistic solutions. We love to start off in ideal solutions and then move more and more towards a realistic wastewater by controlling the composition. So here we started moving towards more realistic synthetic urine by adding magnesium and calcium, as you can see, and those start to take up some of the sites because they're doubly charged. And then the last thing we can see is looking at this equilibrium selectivity. We've tested dozens of different resins for this selectivity. How many ammonia uh, molecules are absorbed versus potassium? And we've seen that our adsorbents so far far outperform others in terms of their selectivity. So selectivity greater than one means you're nitrogen selective, and ours are able to reach up to 10, and all the others we've tried are much, are at best like 1.05. So this is encouraging, and we're continuing on some of this work now. So as we think about adsorbents, one of the Achilles heels of adsorption processes is what happens when your Brita filter gets full, right? You need to replace it or you need to regenerate it so that you can use it over and over again. We found through some of our estimates, we kind of did a thought experiment and said, let's say everyone in San Francisco, and this is a big future thought experiment, so bear with me, but let's say everyone in San Francisco adopts our technology tomorrow, right? And they have these household Brita filters that are within their uh, urine separating toilets and those recover uh, nitrogen from their urine. And then there's a fleet of kind of trash trucks that comes in every week and collects their cartridge and replaces them with a new one. What we thought would happen when we tried to estimate the environmental impacts of this thought experiment was that the fleet of trash trucks would be the most expensive part. And when we think of energy emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, right? A whole nother fleet of trash trucks would be the biggest part. But when we look at this graph, that fleet of trash trucks is the white bar, the cartridge collection. The big purple bar that your eye sees first in terms of energy and greenhouse gas emissions is actually just the acid that we use to regenerate the resin and, and use it over and over again. So this was a surprising result that then made us think we have to find a better way to reuse this resin so that we can extend its lifetime. So then we went back into the lab and we said, okay, we can use the same acid, sulfuric acid, and try to tune its concentration or we can tune how fast we feed it and see how we can get sharper peaks here in terms of the concentration relative to time or volume. And then uh, when we've done work in Kenya as well, we've seen here that some encouraging results where here the, the cost of our ion exchange process here was much lower than the cost of urea or diammonium phosphate, two common fertilizers used in Kenya, and even lower than the cost of just trucking the urine away. But when we zoomed into that bar, you can see two thirds of the cost is still the regenerant, that acid cost relative to the one third for the resin. So all of this led in many ways to thinking, how do we come up with better ways to regenerate resins and extend their lifetime? 
So what we settled on, unsurprisingly, given our other expertise in our group, is electricity. What if you can use electricity to regenerate these resins and use them over and over again and replace chemical inputs with electricity, even intermittent electricity? So Lucas, one of the postdocs in our group, has been doing exactly this. He's been doing this on urine and also on uh, a wastewater that then goes through reverse osmosis. And so what he's been able to see is that in the top right here, we can generate mild acid and base, so pH 3 and pH 11, just, but just through electrochemical uh, treatment of water. And then we can recover this nitrogen over and over again, not 100% of it, but say 80% of it, and do that over and over again just using electrons, just by using electricity. And so we've continued this work and done it in several systems, and now he's actually combined the resin into an electrochemical reactor so he can do it in one step. In terms of a few key images here, we can look more closely at these resin beads and see that the nitrogen gets distributed around the surface of them rather than in the inside. And so these are basically microscopic pictures of where the nitrogen is going relative to some of the other functional groups like iron. This uh, graph you're seeing here has to do with, again, the core of the resin is harder to regenerate. And so by using mild acid and base, we're able to dictate where the regeneration happens, which you couldn't do uh, before. Next slide. So going back to these um, material innovations, we're focused on both materials, designing new materials, and process innovations using electricity to be able to drive this nitrogen recovery uh, forward. Next slide. So um, next I want to talk about lithium for a little bit uh, because we'll be going to the Energy Open House for those of you who are available. And I kind of previewed this already, but looking at this graph, this is the lithium ion battery production over the next several years, especially ending in this decade. And you can see that it's increasing almost exponentially, number one. And two, the biggest portion of this is EVs, electric vehicles, okay? And so then if we're looking at where is all this lithium gonna come from, these supply chains are starting to take form, but demand is increasing, and so we're gonna keep consuming lithium and mining lithium. We have to think really intelligently, and we have sort of a gift opportunity here to think about the end of the life cycle, even while we're still uh, early in the design process of lithium ion batteries. Where are we gonna get lithium from? Now, interestingly, if we look at this from a mass balance perspective, one ton of lithium that's battery grade can come from 750 tons of brine, right? So this is like, you may have heard of salt lakes where we can recover lithium from, 250 tons of ore if we're mining it, or just 28 tons of batteries that we've already put our work into making. So the choice here is really obvious. Go after the batteries. That's where it's most concentrated, and that's where you can get the most bang for your buck. But we're seeing that only less than 1% of lithium is recycled at this, at this point in time. So there's an opportunity here. How do we think about recycling lithium from batteries? And how do we think about what this should look like in terms of a circular economy? So uh, for those of you uh, who know a lot about electric vehicles, they have lots of different types of batteries that we can use. So one is a nickel manganese cobalt, or NMC111, because they're kind of equal in their masses, as you can see, their mass weights. Okay? But lithium is it's currently in recycling methods. It's left in the waste product, right? So it's in the slag here in normal metallurgical processes. What we're proposing is actually to move the lithium separation up and do it first. But what that means is we need to be quite selective in doing it, which we're not able to do. And so that's what we're working on now. One of my PhD students, Sam, is using actually algae and trying to use algae to make natural biodegradable resins that are also highly selective for lithium. And so algae have this kind of egg crate formulation. So think about when you put an egg in a carton and there's this support structure here. And there's different um, sizes of, ad of atoms or ions that can fit within that egg crate. And Sam is designing these egg crates to, that have normally been made for poly or multiply charged ions, like manganese or like cobalt, but designing this for lithium instead. And so again, this we're using mild pHs here to regenerate and do the work for us. And these are made from algae rather than fossil fuels. Next slide. And then she, one of our postdocs, is working on a similar approach, but for membranes that flow through instead of these adsorbents. And so he's taking reverse osmosis membranes that are polyamide as a platform, and then changing the ligands, or these uh, adsorbing molecules in the membrane, to facilitate lithium transport selectively. And here, the separation to go for is lithium versus magnesium, because they're so similar in size. And so this graph is just showing, if you look at um, lithium in the middle here, and magnesium, you can see lithium is here, magnesium is here. These have very similar bare ionic radii. And then on the y-axis you're seeing here is with the waters of hydration. So this is why we try to separate lithium from magnesium as the hardest separation to do, and then lithium from sodium as the second hardest. Next slide. So in conclusion, in terms of uh, what we're doing for selective materials, we're focused first on adsorbents and second on uh, membranes. You can go ahead and animate, Anna. 
Um, and then what we're focused on is trying to recover the maximum value we can from batteries. And this graph is just showing again for things we recycle all the time, glass, metal, plastics. This is the basis for it. This is how much we can get from them, right? We're getting around a dollar per kilogram. Here for batteries, we're more like in the several dollars to $10 per kilogram. The opportunity here is huge. The urgency here is even bigger. So let's go on to the last part here. We're gonna talk about contaminant fate here and talk about sensing and then the last idea of wastewater-based monitoring. So back to the nitrogen story here. One of the big challenges left in our environmental engineering and chemical engineering field is being able to sense pollution before it happens. Right now, we're always playing a catch-up game. Pollution happens, there's a big spill, and we think, oh my gosh, we have to clean it up. What if we could sense that pollution is happening first and clean it up before we start to see the spillover effects? When we look at nitrogen, one of the challenges here is that nitrogen doesn't come most of the time from point sources. You can't find the pipe where it came from. Instead, it comes from runoff. It comes from these dilute sources that we can't control. And so that means there's a huge need here to be able to sense nitrogen in the environment. And our solution so far in collaboration with uh, several other labs here at Stanford, including uh, Professor Sineski in aeronautics and astronautics and Professor Maher in, um, in earth system science, is to have distributed and deployable uh, nitrogen sensors. And what if we could have these, they're in the water and they're just down a coastline, down a river, uh, down a stream, and they tell us when the nitrogen uh, concentrations get too high and then we deploy a solution there to clean it up. And this would happen before all the algae blooms happen and thus help us to clean up pollution before we start to see the runaway effects. So we've done this by starting to miniaturize electrochemical stripping and 3D print some of these reactors. And then the key here is to use capacitance, which is just about a change in charge to be able to really um, sensitively detect ammonia. So what does this look like? You've seen a, a graph like this before, but in a different way. This is a mass balance of ammonia concentrations over time in electrochemical stripping, but now for a miniature sensor instead of for a big treatment process. And the difference here is that for a sensor, well, let's start with the treatment process. For a treatment process, you need to be able to remove as much as you can, right? I don't, if my student comes to me and says, oh, Will, I removed 30%, I say usually, that's not good enough, we want 90, right? But if instead we just need to sense, we don't need to remove it all, we just need to always get 30%, right? And that means that we can track, based on the time here, how much, uh, how much time we need to sense for before we know where we are in terms of where the ammonia is in which chamber. So then what we've established is that by capacitance, which isn't selective, but just detects changes in charge, plus electrochemical stripping, which isn't sensitive, but is selective, putting those together is what allows us to sense nitrogen in any wastewater. And so we've been able to do this um, and go over a huge concentration range. And in green, you're seeing here lots of different wastewaters and environmental waters. In gray, you're seeing kind of comp competitor sensing methods. And in orange, you're seeing this combination of electrochemical stripping and capacitive detection that gives us a wide range of detection limits. Okay, so we'll wrap up with the story I've mentioned a couple times, which many people are doing across the country and the world, which is being able to mine health data from wastewater. So wastewater can give us things like lithium, so, um, uh, magnesium, they can give us potassium, uh, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, all these other things. It can also give us data about big populations in a way that drives public health interventions. So what this requires, and this is a civil and environmental engineering student in my group, Lorelei, is working on sampling at wastewater treatment plants, quantifying specific uh, genes uh, of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then being able to calculate population and infer community health, such as prevalence of COVID in this case. And so we're not the only ones doing this for sure. There are hundreds of teams all around the world, and you've maybe seen news articles about this. And believe it or not, this was happening before uh, the COVID pandemic. People have actually already used this technique to uh, detect polio virus in wastewater and use that to increase vaccination rates and treatment rates in other countries like Israel. So this is a, a new thing in our consciousness for some of us, but it's been going on for several decades. Let's go to the next part. And what Lorelei has been working on specifically is high resolution sampling. Most of the time we can sample once a day and we just go and grab a sample and hope that it's representative, right? Lorelei instead went to a treatment plant for three days and collected samples every single hour and then tried to see if that uh, would help us in, uh, dictate the decision about when, when to sample uh, most effectively. So what we did is we sampled during a low incidence period of new COVID cases in our area, and we sampled from a wastewater treatment plant local to the Bay Area. So this was in March of last year, uh, which feels like forever ago and yesterday, right, for many of us. Um, but what we looked at were some diurnal loading patterns. And so just over time, you can see the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA, the nucleic acids here, 
And we're looking at two different targets within that. So just think of those as two different genes. And so uh, what we can see here is there are some times where we see, and you're looking at time on the x-axis. So there are some times when we can sense it, and sometimes when it's below the detection limit in the red line. Then we also looked at things like the total flow in black, and also the ammonia in, uh, sorry, the ammonia in black and the flow rate in blue. And so what this allows us to do is hopefully use ammonia as in kind of a baseline of how much wastewater there is, and then use the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, uh, gene count that we get and normalize those two so that we can estimate the total population and the total population uh, that is infected with COVID or is at least releasing COVID in their stool or releasing SARS-CoV-2 in their stool. So wrapping up here, resource recovery, we've gone a lot of places, but hopefully you've grabbed onto at least one vignette that makes you think about the fact that wastewater is something that is full of resources, whether it's health data, whether it's uh, battery precursors, whether it's fertilizers, disinfectants. We haven't even talked about rocket fuel and jet fuel that we can recover from wastewater. But in short, the sky is the limit. There are so many things in wastewater uh, that we can recover, and it's simply an opportunity that's huge and one that's worth taking advantage of. So I'll leave you again just with this quote to kind of chew on and think about later. But again, that pollution is nothing but resources we're not harvesting. It's resources we've left behind and decided they're waste. Another way of thinking about this is when we think about biology or life cycles, there's no real such thing as waste. Any organism's waste product is consumed by another organism. How can we design our society to be more reflective of this biological reality? Any waste is repurposed for another, uh, for another uh, use. In short, any wastewater and every wastewater is mined for maximal value. And our children, our grandchildren won't identify the term wastewater because it won't make sense to them. That's kind of the vision we're working towards. So with that, I'd love to thank my fantastic group here and several of our funding sources, many of whom have been here at Stanford to help us get started. And thank you for your attention.